we pointed out the seven churches and that the seven seals operate upon the principle of repeating and large but we noted that it's the, f the first four seals repeating and large upon the first four churches but then there is a break in the seals internally in revelation and in in prophetic application too in history they don't these the last three seals do not repeat and enlarge upon the last the history of the last three churches and in order to show you the four three combination the four seals then the three seals I put up here the seven trumpets where that is also illustrated the first four trumpets uh, and then three woe trump trumpets this four three combination is illustrated in each of these lines and then once we understand as the Millerites do that the last three churches are contemporary to one another Sardis Philadelphia and Laodicea was there in the Millerite history it's also all present at the end of the world we can also see the, the break here but just so you don't think that I was misleading you the it's the, in this history of Pergamos it's after Constantine divides the kingdom in two in 330 it's then that the four first the trumpets begin to blow all right so if you're going to look at the repeat and large aspect of it and be historically correct in this history you have the f the first second third fourth trumpet it brings you to 476 and of course Thyatira starts in 538 and in the history of Thyatira you have the fifth and sixth trumpet or the first and second woe. So I, I, it, and I'm not trying to teach that right now I'm just making sure that you understand that I wasn't trying to mislead anyone I was trying to show the 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 four three breakdown of the churches the seals and the trumpets and now if you would go to page 75 um, a, a very nice quote but I'm just going to read the last paragraph from Healthful Living page 280-281 what, what I want you um, you'll notice that the first two paragraphs of that quote are not a quote I didn't for some reason I don't have the break that's, that's a, a summation of, of my thoughts there don't think that that's spirit of prophecy I'll read, though, read it though. It says, John saw the churches as they then existed and as he wrote concerning them, he was identifying what would be half the hereafter, thereafter. The, I'm pretty sure that is spirit of prophecy, but I'm just re-emphasizing that, pulling out of it. The rest is mine. It says, there are a few prophetic arguments that uphold the ap application of applying the history represented by the seven churches to the history of ancient Israel. The first prophetic argument is that the ancient Israel is a type of modern Israel and therefore it is acceptable to apply ancient Israel with modern Israel in a type anti-type relationship. Sister White does this often and if you're not following me what I'm saying is is that the most important representation of modern Israel is ancient Israel. Okay, The most important um, uh, type of the Christian church is ancient Israel and, and Sister White often emphasizes that therefore if the seven churches are representing the history of Christianity from the time of the disciples to the end of the world and if ancient Israel is an illustration of that then we may very well find that the history of ancient Israel is governed by the seven churches of Revelation and that's what we will find. We're going to show that now. And this, um, this, th this is where we're starting. At the bottom of that quote from Healthful Living, she says, The Apostle Paul states that the experience of the Israelites in their travels has been recorded for the benefit of those living in this age of the world, those upon whom the ends of the world are come. We do not consider that our dangers are any less than those of the Hebrews, but greater. Um... There are several quotes along this line where Sister White emphasizes that the history of ancient I Israel is the history of modern Israel. Are we modern Israel? Are we Laodicea? Are all the histories of all seven churches repeated in Laodicea? Therefore, if ancient Israel is an illustration of modern Israel, are all the histories of these seven churches repeated in ancient Israel? 
Yes, they are, okay. Now, on the top of page 76 is where we'll begin. And what I'm saying is this here, um, this section here, up, this is modern Israel. Us. And down here, we're going to look at, why did I do that? Ancient Israel. Right? Okay. In Prophets and Kings, page 714, it says, Today, the Church of God is free to carry forward to a complete to completion the divine plan for the salvation of the of a lost race for many centuries God's people suffered a restriction of their liberties the preaching of the gospel in its purity was prohibited and the severest penalties were visited upon those who dared to disobey the mandates of men as a consequence the Lord's great moral vineyard was almost wholly unoccupied the people were deprived of the light of God's word the darkness and of error and superstition threatened to blot out, blot out a true knowledge a knowledge of true religion what history is she describing there? The Dark Ages, the 1260 years of papal rule, right? And she's saying that's, that's what was going on there, but today that darkness has been dispelled. But notice her next statement. God's church on earth was as verily in captivity during this long period, 1260 years, of persecution, as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during the period of the exile. Sister White is saying that when literal Israel was captive in literal Babylon for 70 years, that that's paralleling when spiritual Israel was captive in spiritual Babylon for 1260 years. Do you see that? What's 1260 and 70? Okay, she's saying... now. now you don't need her to say that, okay? Because Jesus, Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. Let me let me show this to you. I don't know if I did this here, but um, this is the 1260 years of papal rule, okay? What's the historical event that allows us to start this in 538? What allows us to start this is that the the last ruler of the Goths is driven out of the city of Rome. That's the event that allows us to say the third owner is removed. It's when the last ruler of the Goths is driven out of the city of Rome. That's 538. That starts the 1260 years. What do we end that time prophecy with? When the ruler of the city of Rome is taken out of the city of Rome. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. What starts the prophecy? The ruler of the city of Rome is removed from the city. What ends it? The ruler of the city of Rome is removed. <laughs> That's not an accident. Um, what, what starts the, the, the 391 year 15 day time prophecy in the year 1449? It's when a king surrenders his national sovereignty to four powers. Is it not? And what ends that in 1840 is when a king surrenders his national sovereignty to four powers. Correct? Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. What starts the very foundation of Adventism? The 2300 years. Well, the third decree. Doesn't the 2300 years start on the third decree? But at the third decree was the city, build the work of building the city finished? No, the Lord had to raise up Nehemiah to finish build, building the streets and the walls and even in troublous times. But before Nehemiah accomplished his work, he secured a fourth decree. Read it in the Bible. Read it in the spirit of prophecy. This history begins with a three-one combination. Three decrees followed by a fourth. In fact, Sister White says that when Ezra saw how few people came out of Babylon under the third decree, he was greatly disappointed. All right. What ends the 2300 days is when the first angel's message arrives, right? No, it's when the third angel's message arrives. And then, what do we wait for? We wait for Nehemiah's decree, the fourth. Okay? So, what Sister White just said, she says, the captivity of the 1260 years here, 
when spiritual Israel came out of the dark ages here and to build the temple is paralleling when literal Israel came out of captivity with literal Babylon for 70 years. It's the same history. All she's saying is this captivity of 70 years is paralleling this captivity of 1260 years. Literally Israel's captive in literal Babylon paralleling spiritual Israel being captive in spiritual Babylon. Do you see it? Because if you see it, what is this 1260 years? It's the Thyatira. So what is this 70 years? It's Thyatira for ancient Israel. Right? You just agreed to it, right? But we've already talked about it. Some of these churches, they have a cause and effect relationship. And, and what was it that led the Christian church into the captivity of the 1260 years? It was the compromise of Pergamos, right? Why were the Jews taken captive of Babylon? They compromised with idolatry, did they not? That was Pergamos. The reform lines. Remember we mentioned last year, and, or yeah, yesterday, that, that this reform movement in the time of Moses, Moses was a type of Christ, that the reform movement in the time of My Moses is a perfect parallel to the reform movement in the time of Christ, right? The time of the end for Moses was the birth of Moses. The time of the end in the time of Christ was the birth of Christ. The reformer that formalizes the, the message, Moses, John the Baptist. The empowerment of the message is when the Lord comes down and gives Moses the test of circumcision and John the Baptist's message is empowered when the dove comes down at Christ's baptism. Um, the foundational message was set forth by John the Baptist. The foundational message of the Sabbath reform was set forth by Moses in this history. Then Pharaoh says you're going to gather your own straw. Then the Sanhedrin says it's expedient for Christ to die rather than the whole nation perish. Then the manifestation of the Holy Spirit as the plagues are poured out upon Egypt paralleling the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And then you have the Passover which is the very day of the cross. Then you have the disappointment of the Jews with the Pharaoh's army behind them and the Red Sea in front of them paralleling the disappointment of the disciples after the cross. Ultimately out here you have Moses receiving the law which is Pentecost which is to be kept throughout their generations forever lining up perfectly with the Pentecost of Christ's history. And when we went through that before we said that Jesus illustrates the beginning with the end and the beginning of ancient Israel is identical to the end of ancient Israel because in the history of Christ that's when Israel was divorced of God. Do you see that? But the end of ancient Israel in the time of Christ is what? It's Ephesus. Right? That's the history of Ephesus. Amen? Therefore, the history of Moses for ancient Israel is Ephesus. Perfect parallel, is it not? <laughs> do, you, do you see it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's where we start ended with Haskell. He said all the accumulated light of all the ages is fulfilled in Laodicea. Am I starting to lose you? I see one hand going yes. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the rule of thumb here. Okay. Here's what we're saying. Sister White says that the captivity of Thyatira, she doesn't use those words, but the captivity of the Dark Ages, para, uh, the cap, and who was captive in those time periods? Spiritual Israel. She s says it parallels the captivity of literal Israel in literal Babylon during the 70 years. When she does that, she's saying these captivities, the 70 years and the 1260 years, they're type and I type. Okay? Which, which is in agreement with the fact that Literal Israel is a type of modern Israel, spiritual Israel. Equivalent. Equivalent. However, whatever you, word you need to make it fit. This captivity for ancient Israel was 70 years. Up here, this was for 1260 years. But nonetheless, this captivity this captivity, they're paralleling one another. 
and we know that it was the compromise of Constantine that led to this captivity and we know that it was compromise that led the Jews into captivity in Israel for 70 years and we also know that Ephesus for the Christian church is the time period of Christ but and this is where I lose you the time period of Christ is the Ephesus church and then I jump back and I say but oh by the way the time period of Christ is a perfect match for the time period of Moses and you can follow that but what, then when I say therefore the time period of Moses is Ephesus that's where I lose you but that's what it is this is Moses which is Christ it's Ephesus for ancient Israel alright okay equivalent notice on um, page 76 the Bible has the selected messages book 3 page 338 339 the Bible has accumulated and bound to up together its treasures for this last generation what's the last generation and what we're dealing with here it's Laodicea okay last generation all all no, 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 maybe, maybe she meant to say some of the great events all of the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are what? Repeating themselves in Laodicea. All. Okay. So if you think I'm stretching it, maybe I'm stretching it, but at least inspiration is saying the same thing I'm saying. Uh, all I'm doing is trying to be technical to the fact that the history of ancient Israel is governed by the seven churches just as the history of Christianity is governed by the seven churches alright this is this is a fun one to get in your head but it even gets more fun as we get, if we have the time to get through all of this alright so underneath this uh, you'll have from Jeremiah 25 4 through 12 uh, describing you know the the reason that Israel went into captivity compromise and then underneath that under the time of the end I'm on page 76 from Daniel 9 verse 1 and 2 you see Daniel recognizing that the 70 years captivity is over based on Jeremiah 25 12 see where I'm pointing up here Jer Daniel is recognizing that this 70 years is over because this is the time of the end for this reform movement here for them rebuilding Jerusalem the prophecy that was fulfilled that marked the time of the end for them. Now please follow me. The prophecy that was fulfilled in this history of rebuilding Jerusalem was the 70 years captivity and that was the time of the end for this generation because when the 70 years was over it meant that it was time for Israel to come out of Babylon and rebuild Jerusalem. The fulfillment of that prophecy shed light upon this coming history. Amen? Now notice that the fulfillment of this prophecy, the end of this captivity, I'm saying is the time of the end. And we know that the end of this captivity is the time of the end. 1798 for the Millerites. I mean, this is just a simple, easy parallel, but it's very profound. So for me to be saying that this is Thyatira and this is Thyatira, you can prove this all over the place. Right? Mm -hmm. Even if you never thought about it before and Daniel here is is illustrating in verses 1 and 2 the students in prophecy that are understanding from the prophetic word the increase of knowledge that takes place at this time it's now time to come out of Babylon he's a symbol of those people that understand an increase of knowledge in Christ's time it was the shepherds on the hill it was Millers the Millerites in that history there's always a group of people that understand the increase of knowledge as they study God's word um, page 77 2nd yeah. Chronicles 7 13 and 14 this is just going along with Daniel's prayer in order for them for the Lord to restore uh, them to their former position of prosperity in order for he to do that for God's people at any point any point in history when God's people find themselves in darkness and bondage they have to turn to the Lord in prayer and that's what Daniel was doing and this is just a secondary witness to that's what needs to be done so what I'm saying is is that the 70 years captivity for ancient Israel is Thyatira for ancient Israel and therefore this is Pergamos 
this is Smyrna, this is Ephesus. And therefore, this is the first seal for ancient Israel. This is the second seal for ancient Israel. And the third seal for ancient Israel. And the fourth seal for ancient Israel. And why am I saying that? Because we've already identified that the seals operate upon the principle of repeat and enlarge, right? Correct? It's okay. So, so we want to we add to this. Um, but in the first four seals, in the first four seals in Revelation, what, what, are, they, what are they? A white horse? Oh, wh why, why a red horse? What, what makes sense for you for the red horse? Persecution, okay. Uh, what, what here? Black horse. Pale horse. So, but horses. Horses, okay. They're horses. So in Zechariah 1, 1 through 6, it says... Turn unto me, okay, is, is uh, and, and there, it was a question raised yesterday saying, you know, we're, we're identifying the angry horse of prophecy as Islam, but there's other horses in Revelation, and the other horses in Revelation are the horses that represent the seals, and it's here, if you look closely at where we're going right now, that you find that these horses are symbols of God's providential history and the horses of the seals uh, have a specific definition in prophecy that 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 puts him in a different understanding a different category than this angry horse we're dealing with so this is another thing that we can watch for here because the the four horses the four seals of revelation they're also in Zechariah Zechariah 1 1 through 6 in the eighth month of the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be not as your fathers, unto whom, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? They died in captivity. All right. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded by my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doing, so has he dealt with us. Zechariah here is dealing with the circumstances of the 70 years captivity, what brought it about, what happened. It, it happened because they disobeyed the prophet prophets okay so continuing on in verse 7 it says upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month which is the month of Sabbat in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah the son of Berechiah the son of Idu the prophet saying I saw by night and behold a man riding upon a red horse so you got a man riding upon a red horse and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom and behind him behind who behind the man that's riding upon the red horse were there red horses, speckled horses, and white horses. So you got a man on a red horse. Then you have red horses, white horses, and speckled horses. Got four horses, okay. And so in verse 11 it says, because Zechariah wants to know what these horses are all about. He says, and they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, that, no, 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 I, I, I passed over, didn't I? Okay. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? He wants to know what these horses are. And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show you what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. So what are th whatever these horses are in Zechariah, the man on the red horse, the red horses, the white horses and the speckled horses whatever they are the Lord sent them to walk to and fro through the earth then it says and they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the earth myrtle trees and said we have walked to, to and fro through the earth and behold the earth sitteth still and is at rest their work was to walk to and fro through the whole earth and by doing their work of walking to and fro through the earth the earth is made to be at rest and set it still, okay? So what's it mean? What's it mean that the, the earth is at rest and it's still? In the next page you have Isaiah 14, 1 through 7. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and yet choose Jerusalem. 
keep that first verse in mind because we're going to go back to Zechariah and the same reference is there that this is about when the Lord chooses Jerusalem because brothers and sisters it's here at the end of the 70 years captivity that the Lord is once again going to choose Jerusalem he's going to send his people back to rebuild Jerusalem that's that's what's being discussed here of course at the end of the 1260 years the Lord once again raises up Jerusalem spiritual Israel okay so the there's, that's what's being discussed here. And anyway, Isaiah starts there. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring to the, them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou was made to serve the rest is identifying when the bondage and the servitude comes to an end thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon who were the Israelites captive to Babylon thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how hath the oppressor ceased the golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He that who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. The earth is made to rest at the end of the captivity. When Babylon is brought down. And brothers and sisters, have you looked at the 70 year prophecy? That's what the 70 year prophecy is. The, 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 the Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. Did you, do you understand that? You've had, you had three witnesses right at the beginning of this meeting. What starts the beginning of the 70 year prophecy is the destruction of Jerusalem. What is it that ends this 70 year prophecy? destruction of Babylon okay? destruction of a city king, uh, a capital, a destruction of a kingdom, a capital and from the beginning here's where the golden city is brought down, here's where the captivity is finished and when its captivity is finished the earth is at rest but it's this red horse and the red horses and the white horses and the speckled horses that walk to and fro on the earth and cause the whole earth to be at rest. In other words these horses in Zechariah, these four different illustrations of horses, their work of walking to and fro is concluded at the end of the captivity, but that would be right here. At the end of the 70 years, at the end of the 70 years, the earth is at rest, right? The work of the horses in Zechariah is to walk to and fro on the earth. And Zechariah says that when their work is done, the whole earth is at rest and set it still. And Isaiah is telling us that when the captivity ends, the earth is at rest. And we know the captivity for ancient Israel ended in at the end of the 70 years. But we also know that the captivity of ancient Israel ended out here. So up, up here for modern Israel, the earth would have been at rest. But the history that leads to this rest is illustrated in Revelation by one, two, three, four horses. This rest concludes after we are shown a red horse, red horses, white horses, speckled horses, and then the whole earth is at rest. There's more to it. That's just part of the argument, okay? Because what, what we're trying to show you here, whether you understand it or not, at this point, you, this is one you have to go home and test, please. We've started by showing you the arguments that it's easy to see that the 70 years is Thyatira, and they're cause and effect, so there has to be Pergamos of ancient Israel, the compromise that led to Thyatira. And then we showed you that Ephesus is Moses. Now we're dealing with the fact that even the repetition of the seals is illustrated. But there's more, okay? Um, go back to your notes if you would. Um, remember, you have this um, Uriah Smith comment. 
The seven churches present the internal history of the church. The seven seals bring to view the great events of its external history. And these, these seals, you have this, the seals here underneath from Revelation. Revelation 6, 1 through 11. But I go all the way into the fifth seal here. Because I want you to see something in the fifth seal, if you will. If you drop down to the last paragraph of the passage from Revelation 6 in your notes. It says, and when he had opened the fifth seal. You there with me? I saw under the altars the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long? Okay. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little, uh, re should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And you, you see here following um, quotes, two quotes, where Sister White places this fifth seal in Revelation 18 at the Sunday law. Okay, she doesn't, she doesn't place the fifth seal um, in the time period of Sardis. She takes the fifth seal and she places it off down to the Sunday law crisis. But th that isn't my point here. My point is, is in the fifth seal we see a question raised by the martyrs. We won't go into the details of the question. Just the basic, the question there is how long the question there is how long until you ju judge the papacy but I want you to see the how long um, we, you see underneath uh, the two sister white quotes on page 79 on the top the um, James White quote that we already looked at where he's making a distinction between the last three seals and the first four seals he says the first four seals cover the history of the first four churches but not so with the last three seals we've read that already but it's in there. Let's go back now. We're going back to the very next verse in Zechariah. And what we found in Zechariah, the first six verses are describing the condition of, of how Israel went into bondage. And then Zechariah sees these horses and he wants to know what these horses represent. And there he's told that the horses are walking to and fro in the earth. And what they accomplished is they brought the whole earth to rest. And then we went to Isaiah. And Isaiah tells us that the whole earth is brought to rest when the captivity of Babylon is concluded. So now we're going back to the next verse in Zechariah. And it says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, Oh Lord, how long? You see, when it's time for the fifth seal in ancient Israel, the question is, how long? Now, this, this I've said this more than once, probably in a variety of ways, and it's probably something I shouldn't say, but this is where I create stumbling blocks for many who have a problem with my biblical exegesis. I will explain what I mean. I do not believe that there are any accidents in the Bible. When Sister White says this 70 years compares with this 1260 years and in Revelation is immediately after this 1260 years you see the question raised how long and when you go into Zechariah and you find immediately after the 70 years the question raised how long that tells me the student of prophecy must understand there's a direct connection there. He may not understand what it means but it, he at least has to start on the premise this means something. And one of the things it means is that it's the fifth seal for ancient Israel is being marked for us to understand. There are some things that aren't revealed. But those things that are revealed, what does the Bible say? It's for us and our children forever and ever. But we don't get to keep them for ourselves and our children unless we accept them as being revealed. Next verse. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great mercy. The Lord's jealous. He wants to reestablish Jerusalem. They've been in captivity in Babylon. All right. 
And I'm very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore this saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem, crying, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My city through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Okay? Um, what we're saying here is that in the fifth seal, brothers and sisters, the question is raised, how long until the Lord judges Babylon for the persecution of the martyrs during the 1260 years? And they're told they need to rest in their graves until the Sunday law crisis when the second group of martyr, papal martyrs, is made up. And then the Lord is going to judge Babylon. And that's why the judgment of the Babylon in Revelation 18.6 is doubled unto her. Double. Because she's being judged for the martyrdom of the 1260 years and the martyrdom of the Sunday law crisis. Okay, And Sister White places the fifth seal at that time period. And at that time period, when the Sunday law crisis is going forward and the, the answer is being given to the martyrs of the fifth seal, down here in the fifth seal of ancient Israel, the question is, is how long until you reestablish Jerusalem? And brothers and sisters, prophetically, Jerusalem is raised up for the final time when the 144,000 are raised up during the Sunday law crisis. You can show that prophetically. Jerusalem was raised up in 1844 where the Lord, when the Lord entered into covenant with modern Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist people. But that history is repeated to the very letter and he re-enters into covenant with the 144,000 during the Sunday law time period. Therefore, the question of how long until you choose Jerusalem Remember, the prophets are speaking more about the end of the world and the days in which they lived. This is the question about how long until you choose the Jerusalem that's filled with the 144,000. And it's placed right there in the identical history of the question here where Sister White places it in the Sunday Law Crisis. The answer to both these questions is the identical history. It's the Sunday Law Crisis of Revelation 18. But nevertheless, <laughs> I'm wanting you to see more than that. That... Ancient Israel is governed by the seven churches just as the Christian church was governed by the seven churches and the testimony of the seven seals governs both of those dispensations as well. And ancient Israel is the primary type of modern Israel. So this isn't stretching prophetic rules at all. Zechariah continues in, says, Then I lifted up my eyes and I saw and behold four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Israel is a scattered sheep. Jeremiah 50, 17 and 18. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last this king of Babylon hath broken his bones. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon in his, uh, and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. Now, Generally, I have hoped by the time I get to this point in the presentation that the group that I am studying with, that we've had time to deal with the 2520 time prophecy in depth, which we have not done here. Okay, But you can bring the information of the 2520 in here right now and demonstrate that the scattering that was illustrated by the two 2520 time prophecies that came to a conclusion in the raising up the, of the Millerites in that time period is being prefigured here by the scattering that had, had been accomplished on ancient Israel during the 70 years. I'm saying that. I'm not defending it. I can't spend more time on it. It requires too much time. But that's why those notes are there. Next quote, Prophets and Kings. When did we start? Okay. Okay. Sister White's going to talk about these four, corn, four horns. Zechariah then saw the powers that had scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem, symbolized by four horns. Immediately afterwards, he saw four carpenters. Okay. So what, what, what I want you to see here is in this history, there's been a scattering. All right. The 70 years. That's what Zechariah's dealing with. And, and we know that 
that there's been a scattering down here too. So these are parallel histories. We've already shown how, that they're parallel histories. This scattering is the type of this scattering. I've probably ought to just put that out. The, the evil powers have done the scattering. Okay, But after he saw the scattering, he sees the powers that are going to <coughs> gather. If you got drop down to the bottom part of page 80 where it says four carpenters from Zechariah 1 in the next verse, verse 20 it says, and the Lord showed me four carpenters <coughs> then I said what come these to do? And he spake saying these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head but these are come to fray them. The carpenters are come to fray the powers that have scattered Jerusalem to cast out the horns of the Gentiles which lift up their horn over the land of Judah and scatter it. See in these histories, in these histories represented by Thyatira, there's been a scattering of God's people. But the Lord is going to th throw the bad guys out of town. Okay? He's going to fray those horns. And the way that he's going to do it is he's going to have four carpenters accomplish that work. So the carpenters are, are symbolic of the Lord's means of rebuilding Jerusalem. Okay, that's the work. Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, now the Lord is going to build Jerusalem. So what are the four carpenters? Well, the four carpenters are the first decree, the second decree, the third decree, and the fourth decree of Nehemiah. And what dispels the scattering that initiates that comes to a conclusion in the Millerite history are the four carpenters. The first angel's message, the second angel's message, the third angel's message, and this is what we need to see is that the fourth angel's message, this is Nehemiah. This is where the streets and the walls of Jerusalem get built in troublous times. This is our time period. This is why I'm saying that prophecy teaches that Jerusalem is reestablished in our history even though it was also reestablished in Millerite history. This is when the streets and walls are finished in troublous times because the fourth angel's message, that's the fourth carpenter. All right? But the fourth angel's message is the fourth decree. That's Nehemiah's decree. Am I losing you? Nehemiah's decree, it says he's the one that... that Finish the building of the streets and the walls even in troublous times. Now here's the one I want you to see. This is just very interesting. The troublous times of Nehemiah are pointing forward to a specific troublous times that takes place during the fourth angel's latter rain time period. What do the troublous times represent? Well they represent the fact that that God's people are sealed and receive the latter rain during the time period that's called the angering of the nations. When trouble's coming on the earth. And who's the prophetic symbol that brings the troublous times in this history? The angry horse. But <laughs> it's all tying together, I hope, for you. It's the four carpenters that reestablish Jerusalem after they've been scattered by the four horns. It's the four carpenters that reestablished Jerusalem at the end of the world after the scattering of the 2520, the four horns. And we're now living in the time of the fourth carpenter, the time when Nehemiah rebuilds the streets and walls in troublous times. And the troublous times are so bad, brothers and sisters, that if you decide that you're going to enter into that work, you know what you need to remember? That you have to keep your work tool in one hand and your weapon in the other because there's a work to do, but there's going to be a battle going on while you're doing the work. Guarantee it. Underneath uh, the four carpenters on the bottom of page 80, did you think it was going to be this heavy on Sunday? <laughs> We're not even to the heavy part. <laughs> I, uh, Sister White here, you have a nice quote from the Three Decrees. Brother Paul and I were talking about a quote the other night. Um, and I think I was telling them I knew of one. I think this is the quotes. 
um, that I was thinking of. In the seventh year chapter of Ezra, the decree is found in its completest form. It was issued by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, 457. But in Ezra 614, the house of the Lord at Jerusalem is said to have been built according to the commandment of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. These three kings, in originating, reaffirming, and completing the decree, brought it to the perfection required by the prophecy to mark the beginning of the 2300 years. Cyrus is the one that made the decree. Then there was another king that made a decree to stop the work. And the Jews, then there was a new king and the Jews appealed to the new king and said, hey, Cyrus told us that we could, we could build, but we've been stopped. So Darius, he looked in the record book and found sure enough, Cyrus had given them a decree to rebuild the, the city. So he says, okay, I'm making a second decree. Go ahead and build. But it was the third decree of Artaxerxes that finalized it. And that's what Sister White says. In originating Cyrus, reaffirming Darius, and completing the decree, Artaxerxes brought it to the perfection required by the prophecy to mark the beginning. Um, anyway, under uh, next quote, the fourth decree, you will see Sister White commenting that Nehemiah, before he began his work, first received royal letters from the king, the fourth decree. Back to Zechariah. We're just going verse by verse through Zechariah. And it says in Zechariah 2, verse 1 through 13, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said, unto me to measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth thereof and the length thereof and behold the angel that talked with me went forth and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him run speak to this young man saying Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein for I saith the, I saith the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of, hev of the heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. This is the second angel's message, obviously, is it not? Ho, ho, repeated. Um, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I am come, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people shall be my people and I will dwell in the midst of thee and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee and the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the holy land and shall choose Jerusalem again be silent O all, all flesh before the Lord for the Lord is raised up out of his holy habitation the second angel's message is a call out of Babylon when did the second angel's message arrive June of 1842 after that did the Lord raise up out of his holy habitation? Yes. He moved from the holy place to the most holy place and silence took place on the day of atonement. This is describing this history, but it's describing this history. And in this history, here, 1844, in Revelation 11, verse 1, Verse 10:10, 10, 10, John eats a little book, sweet in his mouth, bitter in his stomach. And then in verse 11, he's saying, "Thou must prophesy again." But then in Revelation 11, verse 1, what does it say? <coughs> Go and measure. Go and measure Jerusalem. Okay, leave off the courtyard. So Zechariah, he's seeing the same history, and he's also seeing the man with the measuring rod in his hand, just as is illustrated down here. Parallel histories. Parallel histories, brothers. It's the same story. All the prophets are telling the same story. Yeah. Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. You have it there. Um, now, well, I, I, let me make one more point. Because even though th 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 you can point this into Millerite history, Millerite history is repeated. If you go back, back there, uh, the Lord promised to be um, a wall of fire. Where is this... Yeah, I just read it, but I wanted to read it again. Um, the 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 oh, okay, I was looking at the bottom. Behold the Lord, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be in, 
inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For thus saith the Lord, I will be a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Brothers and sisters, what's the wall represent? The law. And the glory is what? So in this history here, when they came out of Babylon, the literal Israel, when was it that they bought, built the wall? Nehemiah. Okay, that's when the streets and the walls were built. So this reference here about the Lord being the wall, it's not Millerite history, okay? Did they, did they keep the law? No, they didn't understand the Sabbath. This is pointing down here. The, in our day and age, the Lord is going to be a wall around us, and he's going to be the glory in the midst of us, because his character is going to be perfectly reflected in his people that are perfectly keeping his law. So this is the this prophecy is is nailing the Millerite history, but at the same time it's nailing our history. But we know that Philadelphia is repeated in Laodicea, do we not? Okay. I like this study; it's a lot of fun. But there's more material here than I should have properly tried to share with you. Okay, but I like this next quote. Let's go to this next quote, Spalding McGann, uh, page two and three. Thou wouldst not want him to step out if thou knewest thy situation. The des the, that desire is to dis disenthrone kings, but that could not be, for kings must reign till Christ begins to reign. I saw in Europe, just as things were moving to accomplish their desires, there would seemingly be a slackening up once or twice, that the, thus the hearts of the wicked would be relieved and hardened. But the work will not settle down, only seem to, for the minds of kings and rulers were intent on overthrowing each other and the minds of the people to get the ascendancy. I saw that all things are intensely looking and stretching their thoughts on the impending crisis before them. Do you think the world's stretching their thoughts on the impending crisis before us? Do they talk about anything else in their newspapers or radios or TVs? The sins of Israel must go to judgment beforehand. Every sin must be confessed at the sanctuary, then the work will move. It must be done now. The remnant in the time of trouble will cry, My God, my God, why hast thou have forsaken me? The latter rain are, is coming upon those that are pure, and all then will receive it as formerly. When the four angels let go, Christ will set up his kingdom. None receive the latter rain, but those who are doing all they can. Christ would help us. All could be overcomers by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. All heaven is interested in the work. Angels are interested. Brothers and sisters, we can overcome. We can be among that number. This is the time period above all time periods when Christ is promising to provide the power for us to grow up in the full measure of Christians and perfectly reflect his character. But we have to awaken from our Laodicean condition and participate in the work. The Lord does not save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins. There's a work that has to be accomplished that we have to participate in. And it's, it's the prophetic word that is designed to awaken us up to the fact that probation is about to close and the fact that if we don't bring our life up to that standard that we are going to be among Seventh-day Adventists that receive the mark of the beast. Christ is raising up his kingdom. Haskell is, has a really nice illustration of that where he says the components of a kingdom is you need a king, you need a territory, and you need the citizens of the kingdom. The investigative judgment is where the Lord is going through the books to see who the citizens are. But when he gets to the time period of the judgment of the living, his judgment on whether you or I can be a citizen is taking place while we are alive. And in order for me to be a, a citizen in that kingdom, I must confess all my sins and send them beforehand into judgment. If I do this, my sins will be blotted out. And I'm prepared to f receive the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The implications of September 11th, when the mighty angel comes down and the sprinkling begins, is that we've now moved into the time period where that judgment is taking place. Because the whole, you can demonstrate prophetically that the latter rain has begun to sprinkle in Adventism. And therefore, the people that are receiving the sprinkling are people that have what? Sent their sins beforehand into judgment that they may be blotted out. There's never been a more serious message, brothers and sisters. But there's never been a greater privilege than being born in this generation with the possibility of being among those that had the opportunity to glorify the Lord in the greatest crisis of all time. 
prophets and kings speaking of Zech- the next chapter in Zechariah Zechariah 3 says Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people during in the closing scenes of the great day of atonement we just read chapter 1 and chapter 2 which goes right into chapter 3 sister white plainly says chapter 3 this is our day and age this chapter 3 of Zechariah this is the closing of the day of atonement in chapter 4 chapter 3 is too large for this chapter 4 still in Zechariah okay and the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me why do we have to know why do we have to know that Zechariah is asleep I mean, could, couldn't that part be left out okay what seest thou after he's woke up the angel said what seest thou and I said I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are on the top thereof brothers and sisters what's the candlestick with seven branches and seven churches you're, you're taking it in the it's, it's, not, it's not the sanctuary it's, it, it kind of is in the seven churches keep it direct what is the candlestick with seven branches it's the seven branch candlestick that is where in the holy place right Everyone in this room knows that because we're Seventh-day Adventists and we know what the furnishing of the sanctuary is. But yes, it represents the seven churches. Correct? So tell me this. If Zechariah, who's writing this, is a prophet that is living in the time period when they're coming out of Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, shouldn't he know what the seven branch candlestick is? The priestly cast. I mean... But he doesn't know what it is. Let's read it. Um, and, the, and the two olive trees by it, one on the right hand side of the bowl and the other on the left side. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And it's emphasized. Because it says, Then the angel that talked with me and answered and said to me, Knowest not what these be? So Zechariah woke up by an angel. He's shown the candlestick that we all know is in the holy place that he should know what it is and the two olive trees and then he says what is this to the angel and the angel instead of answering him directly says you don't know what this is he wants us to understand that Zechariah didn't know what it was because brothers and sisters Zechariah 4 is doing just what we've been doing we've been taking this history and placing it right down here and Zechariah here is representing the Millerites that were woke up at the midnight cry just before October 22nd 1844 and then on October 23rd 1844 they realized they didn't know what the seven branch candlestick was they thought the sanctuary was the earth but it wasn't he's representing God's people at the end of the world just like John does when he eats the little book that's sweet in his mouth and it becomes bitter in his stomach when the prophets become part of the prophecy they are illustrating God's people at the end of the world okay and if Sister White tells us plainly that the two pipes that he didn't know what they were what are they? What are the two pipes? Yeah, but, but what are they? Ah, the Old and New Testament. That, that's what conveys the oil to it, is it? That, and for the Millerites, the Millerites, the two pipes were the Old and New Testament. But for us, the 144,000, it's not the Old and New Testament. What's the two pipes for us? Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. Remember, Miller's casket was... 10 by 6 by 6 but at the end it's much larger 10 times brighter and more beautiful because it has two pipes and that might not be well received but it's there all right where where are we uh the two olive trees so what are the two olive trees if you go to um to the middle of page let go, go to um, page 84 we got to bring this to a close top of page 84 it says from the two olive trees the golden oil was emptied through the golden pipes into the bowl of the candlestick and thence into the golden lamps that gave light to the sanctuary so that from the ho- holy ones that stand in God's presence his spirit is imparted 
to the human instrumentalities who are consecrated to his service. The mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate to God's people that heavenly grace which alone can make his word a lamp unto the feet and a light to the path. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord of hosts. Okay? If you go back, um, I, uh, the next quote, uh, yeah, I'm struggling with how, how much to say about this. This is illustrating Millerite history, it's illustrating our history, and I'm trying to bring this to an end. As Zechariah is awakened, and he re is illustrating God's people at the end of the world that don't know what the seven golden candlestick is, he's representing the Millerites who are awakened at the midnight cry, and they don't understand the furnishing of the sanctuary because they thought the sanctuary was the earth. But at the same time, if you remembered, we showed you when John ate the little book and it was sweet in his mouth and became as bitter in his stomach, we showed you that he represented both the Millerites and he represented the 144,000. Because John is told before the whole experience takes place, this is what's going to happen. And Sister White plainly says, the Millerites didn't know what was going to happen in advance. So John is primarily representing the people that know in advance the experience. And the experience is this reform line that is repeated in our history that we know. We know the Millerite history. So John is representing both the Millerites and the 144,000 and Zechariah is too. Because when we wake up during the latter rain time period in our history paralleling when the Millerites woke up in the midnight cry, we're going to find that we don't understand what the two pipes are. And the two pipes are the, the, the avenues that the Lord pulls, pours the Holy Spirit out upon his people. And in Adventism, we think we think very many very have very many misconceptions about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We think that it happens strictly at the Sunday Law. Uh, we think many of us think that that's what's going to perfect our Christian character, which Sister White says is just deadly to think that. When we get reach this time period in history, inspiration teaches us that one of the things that Adventism is not going to understand is the details of the latter rain and how the Lord communicates the latter rain message to its people. The next quote says, Review and Herald, July 20th, 1897. The anointed ones, standing by the Lord of the whole earth, have the position once given to Satan as the covering cherub. By the holy being surrounded his throne, the Lord keeps up a what? A constant communication with the inhabitants of the earth. The golden oil represents the grace which, with which God keeps the lamps of the be believers supplied, that they shall not flicker and go out. Which sounds like the parable of the ten virgins. Were it not that the holy oil, now here's the holy, holy oil that's coming down through the pipes, brothers and sisters. And if I ask you what the holy oil was right now, you'll tell me the holy oil is the Holy Spirit. Okay, <laughs> so that's what we will say. The, were it not that this holy oil is poured out from heaven in the messages of God's Spirit. The latter rain is a message. The latter rain is a message, brothers and sisters. Oh, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Symbols will represent several things, but the part that we don't understand as Seventh-day Adventists is that there is a latter rain message, even though we understand it. We know in Adventism that Jones and Wagner brought the latter rain message in 1888, but here at the end of the world, we don't understand that the latter rain is conveyed to us in a message. And because we don't understand that it's conveyed to us in a message, we don't look for the message. Because we've just been woke up. We're Zechariah, and we don't understand what that the seven branch candlesticks is and the two golden pipes. Am I going too fast for you all? No, back here I think I may be. I'm sorry, but yeah, I'm not done. I'm not. Let's go back. We're not th that this holy oil is poured out from heaven in the messages of God's spirit. The agencies of evil would have entire control over men. God is his, God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications that He sends to us. Thus we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those in darkness. When the call shall come, behold the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. That's the midnight cry, brothers and sisters. That's the loud cry too. Because the parable of the ten virgins is repeated again to the very letter. 
when the call shall come behold the bridegroom cometh go you out to meet him those who have not received the holy oil those that have not received the latter rain message who have not cherished the grace of Christ in their hearts will find like the foolish virgins that they are not ready to meet their Lord they have not in themselves the power to obtain the oil and their lives are wrecked but if God's Holy Spirit is asked for if we plead as did Moses show me thy glory the love of God will be shed abroad in our hearts through the golden pipes the golden oil will be communicated to us not by might not by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts by re receiving the bright beams of the Son of righteousness God's children shine as lights in the world shall we pray Heavenly Father, we ask that you would awaken us as you did the prophet Zechariah and then provide us with discernment to understand the message of, that is sent through the holy oil and as Brother Sam said that we need to also understand the conditions that you have set forth that are set there as things that we must accomplish in order to participate in that experience. But Lord, we want to be among those that, that understand this message and, and that allow this message to change us into your character. Amen. That the world can see the wall of fire around your people and see your perfect character within your people. That the world can be tested by this manifestation and that this time of sin can be finished. We thank you for the prophetic word that you're unfolding to your people at this time. We ask that you continue to, to bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit that we can understand these things correctly. And I once again ask that you place a serious and solemn burden upon every heart and soul here that when we come down off this mountaintop that they open the Word of God, the Spirit of Prophecy, the Bible and test these things and see if they're valid or if they're just private interpretation. We thank you for, filling, for, for fulfilling your promises upon us to this point, ask for your continued blessing the rest of this day in Jesus' name. Okay. Amen. All right. So we have three minutes to get down to lunch. <laughs> so, shall we continue the questions after the next meeting? Yeah. Yeah. All right.